Welcome to Decoding Healthcare Research, a podcast by Agora Project. Join us as we delve into the behind the scenes world of groundbreaking research and the dynamic healthcare industry, interviewing top paper authors, engaging experts on industry related topics, and exploring medical subjects that affect our daily lives. And now, your host, Dr. E.F. Rain. Welcome to Decoding Healthcare Research. I'm your host, Efrain Riveros, Dr. E.F. Rain. Today, we are going to be talking about the microbiome. Uh, this is a very important topic that is becoming popular, especially lately, uh, in, in not only in academic, pa- in, the, in academic papers, but also in is even making the headlines in the news. So we are honored to have uh, an expert. We have um, Dr. Don Baudish. Uh, she's a full professor at McMaster University, a Canada Research Chair in Aging and Immunity. And uh, we are going to be discussing some of her papers. So first of all, welcome, Dr. Baudish. Thank you so much for having me. It's such a great opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much. So we are going to start talking about a paper that was uh, published in the journal Cell Press. Um, the, the title of the paper is The Gut Microbiota in Unhealthy Aging. Disentangling Cause and Consequence. This paper was published in uh, 2020, and uh, we are also going to include some aspects of, uh, of another paper that, that her team published in 2017 that talks about age-associated uh, microbial dysbiosis, promotes intestinal permeability, systemic inflammation, and macrophage dysfunction. This one was published in the, in the journal Cell Host and Microbe in 2017. So first of all, this is a very specific topic and, uh, and you happen to be one of the leaders in the world. So what uh, motivated you to start exploring uh, this topic for your research? Well, the story behind the story is one of true sort of curiosity based science and wandering uh, aimlessly (laughs) until you get to a real question. So as one of the immune cells I'm really fascinated by are macrophages and macrophages are influenced by their microenvironment. And I also really love reading about the history of science. So Eli Mechnikov, who's the father of the macrophage and won uh, the 1908 Nobel Prize for his work sort of discovering macrophages and phagocytosis. Uh, One of my students, my first PhD students, had given me a book he'd written around that time. And uh, and it was a, you know, an early edition print. It was just a beautiful piece of uh, work. And in one of the chapters of it, he actually hypothesized that the gut microbiome uh, influenced the integrity of the gut. And he hypothesized that the microbes changed with age and made the gut leaky. And when it was leaky, he noticed that the macrophages that were in the sort of luminal area of the gut um, seemed to become unresponsive. And one of the things that was so brilliant about his observations is what he would do is he would take cattle that had died of botulism and all sorts of things that one would not dissect with one's bare hands in the modern day. But And he would look at their brain macrophages and their gut macrophages. And he noticed in both cases that these macrophages look like they'd been, well, he called it toxified. What he uh, had realized that when there was a really fulminant infection, when there was like, it was, you know, someone was having a fatal infection, their macrophages would lose their ability to phagocytose things. And he also noticed they became what he called angry. So they'd have lots of vacuoles in them. And now fast forward to the modern era. And what we know is what he was seeing was the fact that these macrophages were producing a lot of cytokines and inflammatory mediators, hence all the vesicles. Um, But they would lose their phagocytic activity for reasons that are still sort of unclear. And he said, because the brain and the gut both have these intoxified macrophages, perhaps when this gut gets leaky and the microbial products get into the gut, they circulate through the whole body and cause all the macrophages to become less functional. So he was so brilliant because he was the first person to really realize that chronic inflammatory disease affected macrophages across the entire body and that the gut might be sort of a trigger of systemic inflammation with age. Um, And he actually was one of the people who first created probiotics. So he had traveled in his vacations and found parts of Europe where people drank a lot of probiotic milk or a lot of uh, milk with live bacteria in them or yogurt with live bacteria in them. 
and noticed that a lot of those people seem to be healthy older adults. So we got really fascinated with like, you know, finding the microbes that might be associated with this. He purified the the microbe that's in um, uh, Denon yogurt, you know, the yogurt that you might use mm -hmm. today. So anyhow, the long story behind this is that I was really fascinated with these amazing ideas he had. He had a strong history of being right, hence the Nobel Prize, but he was never able to experimentally demonstrate that the changes in the microbiota with age, the leaky gut, the intoxication of the macrophages was a real thing. You know, it was sort of done by observation. So that paper was started because I thought, wouldn't it be amazing if we could prove this hypothesis? And so we used mice and germ free mice and uh, worked on that paper and the rest is history. Yeah, and it's actually very interesting because early in my career, um, my first fellowship was in critical care right after I finished my residency in anesthesiology. And I remember that in the ICU back then, I'm talking about uh, the last part of the 90s and beginning of the 2000s, we focused in the ICU on the concept of bacterial translocation mm -hmm. as an important aspect in sepsis and the development of uh, multiple organ failure. And I remember that it, there was a lot of enthusiasm back then, and but that started fading away over time. Mm -hmm. And lately, uh, it's being re revisited, but in a different context. So when I started reading about uh, li lifestyle mm -hmm. and behavioral changes mm -hmm. and how they affect uh, the, a healthy living, mm -hmm. and I started seeing that the microbiome is starting to be part of that equation, that... Um, was an opportunity for me to basically pick up where I had left off a few years ago and then my interest was sparked and um, and that is actually my next question. So there have been multiple publications showing that the changes in uh, lifestyle behaviors as associate, are associated with healthy living. The gut microbiome at the same time is involved in those processes. So the lifestyle changes affect the microbiome and is the microbiome instrumental in that relationship? I love this question because the first paper that you mentioned, the one that was cause or consequence, was really me trying to get my head around this very question because you can sort of draw a cycle of how the microbiome affects healthy living two ways. You can say uh, the microbiome or changes in the microbiome can cause this leaky gut and this inflammation and then lead to these health consequences. But you can also do it the other way as well. So we know that people who have chronic uh, diseases, people who have a high fat diet, you know, a lot of that, that high fat can solubilize the LPS and the bacterial components and bring it into the bloodstream. So it can actually cause some of the gut leakiness. And one of the things I'm particularly fascinating about, fascinated about is I'm, in the early days of microbiome research, we thought we'd find that one bad bacteria, you know, that one thing that caused your gut to be leaky with age or within Crohn's disease or IBS or whatever disease you so desire. We get rid of that bad bug and then the, then we'd be better. But of course, that is, nothing in life is that simple. And if there was one bad bug, it would have been easy to find. So now our understanding of how the microbiome changes in health and disease is really different, where we realize now that a lot of those inflammatory processes in the gut actually change the nutrient composition. And uh, so, for example, let's say you have a lot of neutrophils immigrating and you have lots of reactive oxygen species being produced or things like that. That's going to shift the ratio of anaerobes and aerobic bacteria, facultative aerobes. If you change the redox potential of a lot of the, the iron or other um, ions, some microbes can really benefit from that and some can be starved. So now we really understand that sometimes inflammation and all those metabolic changes that happen in the gut they're the ones that cause the microbes to change. It's not the microbes causing the inflammation, it's the inflammation feeding some microbes and starving some other ones. So this helps us understand why so many of the um, interventions or things that we might do to keep ourselves healthy have this positive impact on our gut. As an example, it's a little bit hard to understand why exercise is associated with a healthy gut microbiome because how do those microbes know that you've been doing your workouts? Uh -huh. But when we think about exercise or eating a high fiber Mediterranean style diet or or uh, those sorts of things as being things that sort of lower that 
basal inflammatory status, then it helps us understand that, that those improvements in the gut or those changes in the gut microbiota um, are due to, you know, these sort of systemic uh, changes that change the nutrient composition for the microbes in our gut. Yeah, and this inflammation becomes like a key factor, right? And um, the inflammation in the context of aging is associated with these changes. So uh, how do you conceive that, re that relationship between age, mm -hmm. inflammation, and microbiome? Yes, this is an interesting question because, of course, as we age, it's not a homogeneous process. So I always say anyone who's gone to their high school reunion has seen a healthy and an unhealthy ager at the same chronologic age. It's always yeah. a bit of a shock to the system, right? And there are so many factors that influence biological aging, smoking, uh, lifestyle, stress, uh, sex, pre-existing conditions. And it turns out that people who have higher than age average levels of inflammation are more likely to age poorly and are more likely to have many of those diseases or those or factors that we associate with being unhealthy ager. So it stands to reason that that uh, inflammatory milieu that's higher in people who have these you know, difficult lifestyle choices or um, low socioeconomic status or lots of stress, a poor diet, contribute in a disproportionate way to the microbiome. So we always say aging starts in youth or even in utero. And uh, it looks like a lot of those lifestyle changes influence the immune system. And one of the, my favorite immunology facts, my very favorite immunology fact, is we always think of the immune system as being something that you measure in blood, right? Because you take blood and you do your CDCs mm -hmm. and things like that. But only one to 2% of your leukocytes are ever in the blood at any given time. And a full on 40% of them are in your gut. 40%, can you imagine? Their job, is to keep those gut microbes at bay. And so yeah. anything you do that influences the immune response is going to change that conversation between the bugs in your gut and your immune system. And in that conversation that you mentioned between the gut and the microbes, there is uh, there are like physical barriers as well, right? So we have like uh, mucus and uh, the, that kind of separates the microbes from the epithelial cells. So, and you have been working on that. So what is your take about the role of uh, the production of mucin in, in mm -hmm. the gut? Mucin is so important because it really is that barrier that says anyone who stays in their lane, we're not going to worry about, right? So uh, we think of, you know, our immune system as being like a warrior ready to fight at any given circumstance, but really it would much rather ignore what it doesn't have to deal with. And the mucin provides that really important layer that as long as everyone stays outside of that mucin layer, there's really no reason for uh, the immune system to get involved. However, pathogens, of course, want to breach that. And so whenever they breach that, that is when the immune system starts to, to get involved. And one of the things that people have found in the context of the aging gut is that mucin layer can be discontinuous. So you can find patches where the mucin layer is either very, very thin or uh, non-existent. And the hypothesis is that allows an interaction that wouldn't normally occur where normal commensal microbes that normally would, you know, stay above that mucin layer um, aren't entering. Alternatively, there are some mucin degrading bacteria that seem to have this really Jekyll and Hyde role in the gut microbiota. So on one hand, by eating the mucin, they encourage the turnover, which is thought to be a good thing. On the other hand, if they're the ones eating away at that mucin so that the epithelial layers evolve, then that's really a bad thing. And it seems that many of these mucin degraders seem to change with age. So whether or not that's um, in a response to, to uh, some of these nutritional differences um, or whether it's, uh, you know, them being a bit opportunistic and eating up the mucin and, and causing problems is, is not totally clear. Yeah, and uh, going back to the, to the aging problem that is actually part of the title here, uh, as we age, we are basically afraid, not so much of dying. Everybody knows that mm -hmm. all of us are going to die we are more concerned about like frailty when we are old and being sick. So eh, I'm going to take this concept of frailty. So as you grow older and older, your 
risk of uh, frailty is directly related to changes in microbiome, right? That's basically what you have been studying. Is that correct? Absolutely. And I think that it's so important to disentangle frailty from chronologic age as you have, because you're absolutely right. You know, if we could all live to 100, close our eyes, dine or sleep, and have lived a healthy life with no disability or impairment, mm -hmm. that you know, would be something that I think most of us would be interested in signing up for. But living with a really protracted period of ill health and losing that independence and mobility is something that I think we're universally really scared of. And frailty is a really complex uh, geriatric syndrome. And there's basically two different theories about how the microbiome is tied into frailty. There's uh, one uh, research group that's looked at a whole bunch of community dwelling older adults and looked at their microbiome and their diet profiles, medication profiles, and came to the conclusion that yes, the microbiota changes, but it's not really a, um, it's not, it doesn't really cause frailty. It just happens at the same time of frailty, perhaps because of these other lifestyle changes. And some interesting insights that came out of that study were the fact that, you know, when older adults lose their partner, their diet goes down. And, you know, I can see that because who wants to cook for one? Nobody. <laughs> yeah. Also, you know, people, the other, some other asso interesting associations, you know, people with arthritis or rather joint issues tended to eat less fruits and vegetables, which are, your microbiome really loves. And again, you know, you can imagine the chopping and the cutting and the being really challenging. Um, so that was one theory. Now, the other theory was a group in Italy who studies these people who live to be over 110, you know, the super centenarians, the, the healthiest of the healthy. They're, they're kind of an unusual group because not only do they live a long time, but they tend to live really well until their final days. Um, they tend to have lower rates of all sort of late life health issues until their very, very final days. Mm -hmm. And that group had found that there seemed to be a series of microbes that really were protective. And once uh, microbes that were associated with ill health started to outgrow, that really pushed them along uh, into this frail phenotype. So that group hypothesized that the microbiome was very much a driver of frailty and not just something that happened uh, consequently. We're doing some studies in mice now, uh, trying to get to the bottom of that because one of the advantages we have in using mouse models is we control diet and medications, right? Our mice get the same diet, <laughs> whereas all of us go through different stages of life where we prefer different foods and, you know, like the vegetable chopping, all these things don't happen in mice. Our data is more consistent with the microbiota being a driver of ill health and frailty. Um, but, you know, in the human context, we have to keep in mind that there are other things that might precipitate a lot of these changes. Like I said, medications, which are sometimes metabolized by the microbiota, uh, diet changes, lifestyle changes, that sort of thing. I see. And, uh, and it's, it's actually quite intriguing. And if we go deeper into the, the role of the microbiome, you mentioned in your paper the role of the production of um, of uh, short chain fatty acids mm -hmm. as as a byproduct that's something that uh, has beneficial effects that's the first part of the question and the second one that is probably even more important is uh, how is the microbiome changing over time as you grow older mm -hmm. is it changing in quantity quality what, what is really happening as as we get old Mm -hmm. So the short chain fatty acid question is really quite intriguing because I think we had the sense that the microbiome helps us. Our gut microbiome produces some nutrients. Vitamin K would be a classic example of that. Helps with digesting some things, breaking down some other things. But one of the things that has really come into focus in the last few years is how much our gut microbes love fiber and how they reward us by eating fiber by creating these things called short chain fatty acids. Short chain fatty acids are small, incredibly stinky, if you've ever worked with them in the lab, and a volatile compounds that seem to have a lot of health effects on the integrity of the gut. So some of these like butyrate are associated with gut integrity and, and the metabolism of the immune cells of the gut. 
And I love this as a story of symbiosis because it really does help us explain why eating these high fiber diets are so good for us and have so many health effects. One of the things they do is feed those microbes to make those, those compounds that then our epithelial cells and our, the cells lining our gut use to stimulate a bunch of signaling pathways to sort of knit themselves in a really tight way together and to help with proliferation in times of damage. Um, so again, just a wonderful example of symbiosis between uh, us and them. And another good reason to eat kale because your microbes really do. I, people always ask me, should I take probiotics? And I always say fiber is what they want. Give them fiber. Um, so to the second part of your question, the microbiota it seems to undergo a really protracted period of stability in adulthood. So we know about early colonization in children is a really dynamic process. And we know things like breastfeeding versus bottle feeding seems to influence that. There's a lot of movement, but we sort of hit an equilibrium. And that equilibrium seems to last at least from our 20s to probably about our 50s if we're in bad health. And, probably 60s or beyond if we're in really good health. And then things start to change. And the problem with humans is many things change at that midlife mark. You know, we have uh, menopause with women. There's some early evidence that there may be sex differences in the microbiota. Um, <clears throat> medications, you know, we start to develop the chronic health conditions that uh, uh, you know, lead to us uh, having these changes in our microbiota. And then, of course, the immune changes and that conversation between the aging immune system it seems to play a huge role in controlling and sort of shaping and farming the microbes in there. So it's really a continuous pro uh, uh, progress, but there are uh, crisis points. And antibiotics use is a classic example of one of those crisis points. We know that young people bounce back pretty quickly from antibiotics, but older adults take a long time if in many cases, and that's why we see things like C. diff uh, take advantage. So those crisis points in older adults um, can also come at points where, you know, there's major diet or medication changes, there's other lifestyle changes. And this is why I think we really need to work towards dealing with the um, fallout from a major course of antibiotics for an infection, because older adults just do not recover that diversity as quickly as younger people mm -hmm. do. I see. And uh, when we talk about uh, a microbiome, we basically put them like in a single term. And I think that's in part uh, because of the difficulty in pronouncing their names, right? Because it's yes. every, every time I try to read them is is difficult. It's, it's mm -hmm. But out of that uh, big amount or large amount of uh, microbes, are there any like two or three that stand out as, as particularly important? Yeah, I, I think there's a lot of interest in the Acromancia family, and they're an interesting family of microbes, and they really highlight the fact that even if we pick one strain or one species, the, all the strains within that species often have different properties as well. So as an example, the Acromancia family are generally associated with good health and they seem to have this ability to sort of graze the mucus layer to stimulate more mucus production, and that seems to be keep us both on track. Some of them are associated with poor health, like weight gain, obesity, that sort of thing. And one of the challenges, I think, with developing uh, true gut micro um, treatments, and I'll just pop, uh, open a parenthesis to tell you what I mean by that, most of the time when we talk about probiotic use, we're talking about the microbes that have, that are safe to eat because they're in other foods. So they're in our yogurt making foods or our kimchi or whatever and whatnot. None of those microbes are actually indigenous residents of the human gut microbiota. So although they can pass through and they can do things like take up space so that bad bugs can't get in, they don't have the ability to permanently colonize, let alone produce these foods, these search chain fatty acids, or have this mucus degrading. So when we think about the families like Acromancia, there's a lot of interest in developing as true um, microbiota therapies because they have the ability to stick and colonize. 
they have the ability to provide some of these health properties. But even within that family, there are good guys and bad guys. <laughs> so mm -hmm. culturing and learning which one of these is going to be helpful is um, is a real challenge. And we also don't fully understand how host genetics and microbial genetics work together. Like with all medicines, there are people who respond well and people who respond poorly. And oftentimes that comes down to either genetic differences or uh, metabolic differences or things that we don't understand. And it's entirely possible these microbiota drive therapies will be the same. For some of us, we work really nicely with those species that are helpful. Some of us seem to exclude them from our microbiota for whatever reason. So I think it really shows that we really are in early days of developing true microbiota therapies. Yeah, and that brings us back to the point that you mentioned earlier that uh, fiber is what is really important because, mm -hmm. you know, we have been probably biased by the fact that the our our medicine tends to fix things with medications and uh, probiotics can be seen as a pill that you can take and then you fix your microbiome. But definitely the complexity of this goes way beyond that. And, uh, and the role of um, a diet with fiber is probably even more important than the pro probiotics uh, by themselves. And I think it's probably even protective that the names are so difficult to pronounce because people cannot mm -hmm. memorize them and put them in a pill. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's probably true. But um, you mentioned tangentially something about exercise at the beginning. So mm -hmm. combining diet and exercise, do do they have uh, like a common pathways to achieve the same goal in terms of stabilizing mm -hmm. the diversity of the microbiome? Yeah, I think it's still early days and it's challenging. Some exercise studies have shown no effect on the microbiota, some show positive effect. And then, of course, there's epidemiological studies where people say, okay, well, people who exercise more tend to have lower inflammation, ergo, they have more healthy gut microbes, but are those actually causally related or is it a sort of downstream effect? And I think the answer is probably closer to that. I think I always tell people, you know, they say, what do I need to do to grow old, healthy? You know, do I have, what pills should I take? What probiotics I should take? And I said, I'm going to tell you all the things you don't want to hear. You need to eat a healthy Mediterranean diet. You need to exercise. Uh, you need to have rich social interactions. You know, all these things that are, are good for us uh, tend to be good for our microbes too. And I don't think the science is there yet to understand the directionality, but I do think that there's plenty of evidence demonstrating that uh, having a healthy attitude towards exercise and a really healthy Mediterranean style, style diet improves many measures of immune function and a healthy immune system is better able to control those gut microbes. Um, some of the best studies are coming out of um, a group uh, called, oh, I've just lost the, the cohort name. Anyhow, it's a European group trying to study diet uh, interventions and in the microbiome in older adults in various European countries. What I find so intriguing about that is that in young people, many of the probiotic interventions, you might as well, you're not going to get anything out of that. You're just sort of throwing your money away, unless you've just had antibiotics or something like that. But in older adults, because they have less diverse microbes, those probiotic or high fiber interventions seem to have an outsized impact on their global health and on their microbiota. So I think the other sort of um, important part of this is understanding that older adults tend to have less diverse microbes, they have to have, tend to have fewer microbes, but that means you have a bigger opportunity for intervention. You know, when you do intervene, you see really, really big changes. Younger adults, yeah, you don't really see very strong evidence of lasting changes, neither the microbiota um, or uh, that in, in some of those other dietary interventions in quite the same way. So, you know, I think it's never too late to start, I guess, is the take home message from that, you know, and as you yeah. get older, it becomes even more important. But, you know, going back to what you were saying earlier about medicine being a pill, one of the things I I do a lot of public speaking for older adults and I'm always kind of upset by is when an older adult comes to me and says, Don, you've just done this talk on our microbiota and how we should eat fresh fruits and vegetables, but I just don't have the money to do that. What do you recommend for me? Mm -hmm. And in some ways, I think this is a good justification for trying to turn whatever the magic is, either you know fiber or um, a specific microbe into a pill, because mm -hmm. as a prescription, 
people might have access to that in a way yeah, that with their insurance mm -hmm. yeah yeah. yeah, that's that's actually true because and and we see how you know different factors start uh, interplaying here. So it's not only uh, the research part. Now there is a social component to that mm -hmm. and how you can put that all this into practice, and um, and that's super important. So everything that you have said is is super important. But before we we finish, I want you to tell us a little bit your experiments because it's just. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just my my mind boggling seeing everything that you guys do with the mice and everything and specifically uh, one that caught my attention is the the experiments you guys run with the germ free mice and how they were protected from age associated inflammation so can you just tell us a little bit about it. the experiments i'll tell you the story behind the story germ free mice are incredibly expensive because you have to you have to keep them in these isolators. You have to irradiate all their food and things like that. They require really specialized care. And I remember telling the director of my center that I was going to age germ-free mice. And he said, I clearly had more money than sense. But here I am today <laughs> on your podcast. So I guess it was a gamble <laughs> that paid off. <laughs> um, yeah, so we wanted. I wanted to be able to understand the role of the aging microbiome and the age of the host. And... The first experiment we did is we hypothesized that if the microbiome was a driver of this leaky gut and the leaky gut letting in out all those bacterial components was the driver of inflammation, then germ-free mice should not have age-associated inflammation. They should be protected from that aspect of aging. And so we aged the mice for two years because, again, more money than sense, apparently. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and we found exactly that. They didn't have systemic inflammation many of their tissues looked young you would never have known they looked young and to be perfectly frank for a lot of those germ-free mice they looked young as well they didn't have sort of the grain fur and they didn't have a lot of those age-related changes that you know you would immediately look at and say that's an old mouse so that was our proof of principle that the microbiome was indeed a driver of age-associated inflammation because when we eliminated completely these mice looked like i call them the uh Sophia Lorenz of the mouse world because they're all shiny and lush and mm -hmm. good looking and healthy. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then the next experiment we did is, you know, we wanted to say, okay, now let's prove that the aging microbiome, the old microbiome is worse at making age associated inflammation than the young microbiome. So we took young and old germ free mice and we gave them either a young or an old microbiota. So. And what we found was really interesting. We found that the gut became more leaky if they got an old microbiome, but an old mouse that got an old microbiome was even worse than a young mouse that got an old microbiome. And so to me, this was justification that, you know, maybe I did have more sense than money, that yeah. there's an interplay between the physiology of aging, you know, the very structure of the aging gut, its integrity. And then you add another insult on that where some of these bad bugs, this old microbiota, and you got this leaky gut and all the systemic inflammation. So as with all things, nothing is simple. And it's an intersection between the physiology of aging and the microbes and how they change with age. Yeah, exactly. And I think that uh, nicely summarizes everything. So the microbiome is definitely a, an important factor in the equation. And uh, the way to intervene that has to do with lifestyle, diet, uh, probably mm -hmm. exercise, uh, and eventually the use of probiotics. And um, and I think that... that uh, comes to, to a close and um, this conversation has been not only fun but really instructive and I am sure that our audience is going to enjoy it uh, a lot uh, and I want to thank you for, for sharing your knowledge and your wisdom with us today. Thank you so much. Thank you. It was an absolute blast anytime. Thank you so much. So for our audience, uh, you will find the links to the papers that we discussed today in the description and don't forget to leave us your, your feedback. See you in the next episode. Thank you so much for tuning into this episode. If you enjoyed it, please don't forget to give us a thumbs up and share it with your friends and family. Make sure to subscribe to our channel and hit that notification bell so you never miss an episode. If you have any questions or thoughts about today's topic, we'd love to hear from you. Feel free to leave your comments down below. 
For more information and references related to today's discussion, you can find them in the video description below. We appreciate your support and look forward to having you back for our next episode.